to Luke chapter 15 with me. Um, and we're going to look at verses 25 through 32 today. Um, now, when we talk about the, 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 the parable of the prodigal son, it, it seems that we always seem to focus on the younger son, right? He's the prodigal son. Um, and those of you who are older siblings can relate, right? The youngest one gets everything, right? They get all the attention, they get all this, they get all that. They seem to get away with so much more than you ever did. Can I get a witness, huh? Dale, put your hand down. But um, it, the younger one always gets spoiled. So let's, let's, let's recap for a moment what, what's going on in the story. Uh, there was a man who had two sons, and his younger son said, Father, I would like my inheritance now. Which was, a very, which was a very unusual request, which wouldn't happen usually until the father passed, or at least until he was on his deathbed. So he gives him his share of the inheritance, and the son runs off, and what happens is he squanders all the money on irresponsible, reckless living. And uh, he, the, a famine comes over the land, and he winds up getting a job feeding pigs. And he realizes that his life is just in the toilet, you know? And uh, although they didn't have toilets back then, so I'm not going to think about that any further. Um, but uh, he says, well, gee, I, my father's servants are treated better than I'm being treated now. You know what? I'm going to go home, and I'm going to beg my father to take me back. I'm going to beg my father to let me serve as a servant. At least I'd have a roof over my head, and at least I'd have something to eat. So he goes home, and he goes to give the father his big speech, and the father welcomes him with open arms and says what? Put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, and let's have a big party. Okay? And that's where we pick up the story. So, starting in verse 25. Now, his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and he said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, and was lost and has been found. So, let's talk about the older brother for a moment. And I'm going to say this from the get-go with this story. I believe the parable of the... Pro yeah, he looks angry, doesn't he? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I believe the parable of the prodigal son is about the older brother. Now, we say, well, wait a minute, but it's called the prodigal son. Well, who named it that? Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to tell you a story that I've titled the prodigal son. You know, we've, we've titled it that. But I really believe that this parable is actually about the older brother. And you'll see what I mean as we, as we journey through. Keep in mind that the older brother in this story represents the Pharisees, right? Remember, what prompted Jesus to teach this parable? We go uh, earlier in the chapter, and it says what? Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him, Jesus, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Their comments are what prompted Jesus to tell this story, okay? You see, the older son had just come home from working in the fields all day. And I wonder, how many times did he think about his brother when he was working and his brother was off squandering dad's money? Here I am working my tail off in the field and my brother's off doing 
who knows what, who knows where, with who knows who. You see, the, the Pharisees had the same attitude towards sinners as the older son had towards the younger son. You see, when the, when the Pharisees saw Jesus, who was supposed to be, in many people's eyes, the Messiah, a teacher of the word, you know, and many were calling Jesus at least a prophet, and they see Jesus sitting with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. They, they have this attitude and this mindset of, wait a minute, we're the ones who've been committed all these years. Well, these people have been off sinning and ignoring God. Why are you spending time with them? Not unlike the older brother, huh? I'm the one who's been committed to dad all these years while you've been off sinning, right? It's the same, same kind of attitude. So, what's all the ruckus, huh? The party had started without the older brother. They didn't wait for him. The father didn't say, hey, go get the older brother, bring him in. They just went ahead and started the party. He asked his servant, what's going on? What's all the ruckus here? And when he hears what's going on, is he happy that his brother's home? No, he's angry. Is he angry that his brother's home? No, he's angry because his father is throwing a party for him. And he's so angry that he doesn't want to go in the house. So his father pleads with him to come in. He wants him to be part of the celebration. Just like Jesus did not desire to exclude the Pharisees from the kingdom. You see, the Pharisees were angry with Jesus because Jesus was preaching a message of grace which was totally foreign to the Jews and to the Old Testament. Well, at least they thought it was totally foreign. This idea of grace. The Jews were God's chosen people and they were not chosen to keep the message to themselves and they were not chosen to have the cornerstone, so to speak, on redemption. They were chosen to carry the message. So the brother's all upset and the dad is pleading with him. So we get to this idea of uh, uh, unrighteous ind indignation. Okay? Look at how he starts his response when his father talks to him. He comes out and he says, Look! If I ever went to my father and I said, Look, dad, he would have went, and I would have went, let me take that back. <laughs> Look. Translation. Now see here, Dad. I'm going to give you justification for my anger. I'm going to tell you why I'm angry. And once I tell you, Dad, you'll totally understand. You see, there's a, dis a level of disrespect here for his father all of a sudden, isn't there? A son who's been faithful to his dad all these years. All of a sudden, he's upset with him. You see, his respect for his father was intact as long as he approved of his father's actions, so to speak. But as soon as he disapproved of his father's doing, he's going, now see here, Dad. Friends, that's not respect. Look how he continues. He says, he refers to his brother as what? Not my brother. This son of yours. He wants nothing to do with the brother. He wants nothing to do with him. Now, why was the older brother angry? He'd never been honored with a feast. Even though he worked diligently for his father all these years, he's never disobeyed him. And his father has never offered him anything. He says, even a goat. But no, you, you slaughter the fattened calf, which was the, the prize meal for to save for the big special celebration. He's not only critical of his father's actions, of his brother's actions, but he's critical of his father's actions as well. And you pause for a moment and you say, who does he think he is? But why does he feel like he can do that? Because he thought the foundation of his relationship with his father was based on his work and his obedience. That's not good. You see, because that shows that he served his father not out of love, but out of a desire for reward. You might say he, review, he viewed his relationship with his father as more of a servant to a master than a son to a father. Ironic. But his first reaction to this situation is, that's not fair. And 
And you might say the Pharisees were thinking the same way when they saw Jesus sitting and eating and spending time with sinners and tax collectors. It's not fair. How often do we look at God and say, God, that's not fair. But I've asked this question before. Is God fair? No. So, wait, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, what do you mean God's not fair? If God were fair, we would get what we deserve. I don't want God to be fair. Right? Because we deserve nothing. If God was fair, grace would not exist, would it? Friends, we deserve nothing. There's nothing we have done to earn God's love. There is nothing that we have done to have salvation in Jesus Christ. Is that fair? No. And it's a good thing. Remember that. So, at the house, they have what? An obligation for celebration, right? They have to celebrate. The father reminds his son that he, he, has, he already has all the benefits of sonship. He says, you are with me, son. Everything I have is yours. Everything. And I think this is important because it emphasizes the position the Pharisees already have before God. You see, those who are sinners who Jesus was talking to, they were discovering what the Pharisees should have already embraced. Look what Paul says about the Jews in Romans chapter 3. He says this. He said, what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. God entrusted them with his truth, with his word. You see, rather than feeling angry, they should rejoice that others were joining them and would be part of the kingdom. And rather than being angry, perhaps the brother should have been rejoicing that his other brother had come home and once again was part of the family and had seen the error of his ways. You see, friends, in verse 32, the father reminds the older brother that this that. This is your brother we're talking about here. And he says that a celebration is required. We had to celebrate. Why wouldn't we celebrate? The obvious thing to do here is to celebrate. If your heart is in the right place. If you truly love your brother. If you love me, even if you don't love your brother, at least you could celebrate because of the joy that I am experiencing. But here's an interesting thing we'll think about. If you're taking notes, you'll want to flip the page over here. And I want to talk about fraternal traits for a little bit. What do these brothers have in common? What do these brothers have in common? On the surface, they may seem like total opposites, right? Obviously, they have the same dad. That we'll, we'll, we'll skip that part. But as we look deeper, we see that they're, they are both struggling with a lot of the same issues. Bear with me here. And in the end, they actually both learn the same lessons. The first thing is this, that neither son understood the true meaning of grace and forgiveness. Both of them thought the younger, bro the younger son no longer had the right to be part of the family. The younger son felt that way, right? He was going to go back and serve as a servant. And the, the older brother just basically disowned him. Neither of them thought that the younger son should be part of the family. Neither of them considered grace as part of the equation. The younger son expected no grace to be extended to him. And the older son never considered grace even in his own relationship with his dad. Because when he tried to justify his position before his dad, he talked about how he served him, how he obeyed him, how he never broke a rule. So that's the first thing. Neither son understood the true meaning of grace and forgiveness. The second is this. Neither of them realized, what neither of them realized was that they were welcome in the family no matter what. The first son thought he, that, um, the, the younger son thought he had no right to return to the family. The older son thought 
that he had earned his right to be in the family. But both sons are missing out on all that their father had for them. Why? Because they were part of the family no matter what. They were loved by their father unconditionally. You see, both invitations are the same to the older son and to the younger son. Come, join the party. Both are unconditionally loved by their father. Here's the third one. Both sons needed to be broken of their pride. You see, the younger son thinks he knows better. I think I can handle my life better. Give me my inheritance now. And the other one thinks he has it all together. I do everything right. I obey dad. You know? It's kind of like you know, kids in a family, right? I saw these wonderful t-shirts with three children. Uh, with three kids. And they all had a different t-shirt. The first one said, I'm the oldest. I know all the rules. The second one said, I'm the middle child. I'm the reason we have rules. And the third one said, I'm the youngest. The rules don't apply to me. And there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. You see, one thought he was smarter than his dad. Another thought that he was doing everything right. But the solution for both sons is the same. You see, in a twist, the younger son rises and the older son falls in moral state. After all this happens, when the son comes home, all of a sudden the young son, younger son is embraced and lifted up and loved on. And the older son feels discarded and unappreciated. Notice the different attitudes the sons display towards their father. The younger son displays what? Humility. And the older displays indignation. One shows brokenness, and the other shows none. We talked about brokenness last week. That when we are broken, that is when Jesus comes in. And it's all about brokenness. So when we look at the contrast between the brothers, what what is our takeaway in this? What is our takeaway? Well, I want to talk about the right approach. And what I mean by that is, I want to ask a simple question this morning. And the question is, how do we approach our relationship with Christ? How do we approach our relationship with Christ? Both sons had a relationship with their father, right? But they approached that relationship very differently. How do we approach our relationship with Christ? Are we like the older son? Do we think we deserve God's blessings because we are obedient? Do we think we are standing before that our standing before the Lord is totally based on what we do? Here's the problem, friends, is when we think from that perspective, how much grace do we extend to others? who are struggling. When we look at others who are struggling and having a difficult time, our ability to love them and our ability to extend grace starts with us understanding the grace that we have from God. The grace that we don't deserve. I always remember when I was in elementary school that we were always told that people who bully are because they're not secure about who they are. They're going to make you feel bad about yourself because they don't feel good about themselves. And unfortunately, when we are judgmental of other people and we criticize other people, we need to pause and look at ourselves and ask, why are we doing that? Because whatever answer you come up with is wrong. If you think you're better than them, you're wrong. If you think they're worse than you, you're wrong. If you think they don't deserve grace and love, you're wrong. If you think you're more deserving than they are, you're wrong. That's why Jesus said, do not judge others, lest you be judged. Remember that. So, are we like the older son? Or are we like the younger son? And we realize how sinful we are. 
And we recognize that we deserve nothing. And we are overwhelmed with God's grace. The younger son went through quite a journey to come to that realization, didn't he? And we all have moments and experiences and times in life where we've been able to come to that conclusion and understand what we have in Jesus Christ, the grace that we have in Him. So, what is our relationship with Jesus really like? What is our motivation for following Christ? Is it to earn benefits? Or is it a response of gratitude? Do our actions match our heart, or is it just an act? Do you act nice and gracious to someone because you know you're supposed to, because you're a Christian? Or is that where your heart is? These are important things to understand. You know, I've been asked that many times when I try to explain to people and help people to understand God's grace and that there's nothing that I do that is going to earn God's grace, that it's all what Christ did. And I've had people look at me and say, then why do you do what you do? Why are you a pastor? Or why, why do you do the things that... Why, do, why does any Christian do the things that they do? And I, I look at them and I simply say, it's because I'm so, I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. I could never, never offer back to God what he's offered me and what he's given me. But it's out of gratitude that I do the things I do. It's not about me. It's about him. It's always about him. Look at what John MacArthur says about this parable. He said, For heedless unbelievers, especially those like the scribes and Pharisees, who use external righteousness as a mask for unrighteous hearts, the elder brother is a reminder that neither a show of religion nor the pretense of respectability is a valid substitute for redemption. Amen, preacher brother. We need to check our attitude, friends, right? Because it's all about the heart. And we can try to do the right thing and say the right thing all the time, but the truth of the matter is, our heart's going to come out sooner or later. You see, for all of us, the elder brother's attitude is a powerful warning, showing us how easily and how subtly unbelief can masquerade as faithfulness. Please don't confuse obedience for faithfulness, friends. But remember that our Father in heaven is just like the father of these sons, where all that he has is there for us. Not because what we've done, not because what we haven't done, but because of what is already done for us. We are loved by God unconditionally. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this story. And I pray that we would learn the lesson here of understanding what it means to uh, just embrace you with all that we are and with the right attitude and the right heart to be gracious to others and to realize what a blessing we have in you. So as we leave this place, may we leave with an attitude of love, giving our heart to others, expressing grace and love to others as well. May we leave in the strong name of Jesus, empowered by your Holy Spirit, carrying the good news of the gospel so that all will know we serve a risen Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Have a blessed day.